political future of uh, Russia. And uh, I would like to welcome all the panelists. Uh, let me first start with uh, Maria Medras. She's a senior research fellow in uh, Science Sport, uh, School of International Relations in uh, pra Paris, a very prestigious uh, institution, which is also co-organizing this uh, conference. Let me uh, introduce Mr. Mikhail Rol uh, Romansov, who is a as we know uh, from Czech environment, that he signs himself a political geographist and he represents the, an institute of political studies at uh, Charles University in Prague. And uh, Karel Svoboda is also uh, representing the same institute and he is a research uh, fellow there. Uh, so my ideas first is to start uh, with the economy uh, it is uh, clear that the Russian economy is uh, undergoing uh, transformation. There is a question into what extent it is this transformation is caused by sanctions and counter sanctions and into what extent it is uh, influenced more by the uh, very low prices of uh, oil, which is the main commodity which Russia is exporting, and uh, natural gas also. And, uh, and we should speak a little bit about into what extent also sanctions are working as we would have wished, uh, because it is clear that uh, who is damaged are Russian uh, consumers, Russian small businesses, small and medium enterprises, export imports, but who is not threatened are certainly large uh, corporations, especially corporations, especially those who are who are uh, associated with the uh, with the government. So uh, this is probably not what uh, the West was intending to damage this sort of core of pro free market. Uh, um, independent uh, units of Russian economy. So, uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, some. It's not that I myself, like a chairman, that I am against sanctions. I'm obviously not. Some, since uh, the West is not ready to respond in any military way, uh, both technically and uh, economically, and uh, especially as far as the political will is concerned that the sanctions are clearly the only instrument which was, which was left. Also, the, we know that even with the oil prices which would stay on the same level as they are today, uh, the Russian economy would start to grow next year, even though it's going to be a very modest growth. So there is some uh, degree of, uh, of, of an ability of Russians to deal with the, with the new economic situation especially who is very much praised even in Western press is a, a Russian central bank government governor. She really did an excellent job for Russians. I don't know if uh, we can say that she did an excellent job for us in the West, but she definitely was behaving very courageously and professionally. So uh, let's start to talk about these things and uh, I would like to ask uh, Mary to start, and in a second round we would speak more about politics. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here only thinking about what I was asked to talk about, which is the future of Russia. Uh, and we we'll leave to my colleague the, um, I mean, the more detailed uh, discussion of the economic situation. Uh, although I will be also very happy to answer questions on the economic situation. Um, I uh, want to start uh, with what I think is the uh, consensual observation about Russia today, which is that um, Russia is led by a lonely leader who is more and more lonely at home, in a country that is more and more isolated, maybe self-isolated, 
uh, uh, which tends to be uh, uh, my analysis of the situation, but I understand this might be a little more controversial and we just can discuss it. And uh, it is an isolated country that is losing steam economically indeed. And, uh, and that was already in economic recession before the sanctions were voted. I think this is an important point. Uh, recession is not the result of sanctions. Uh, but the re result of many years of lack of investments, <coughs> lack of reforms, and of course uh, the tipping point of the falling oil prices um, uh, and uh, uh, troubles for uh, the ruble as uh, as a currency. Uh, I believe in a few years, in uh, uh, relatively honest history textbooks. Uh, March 2014 will appear as the beginning of the end of the Putin regime. And um, I guess this is what I want to try and argue. Uh, so <laughs> we can have a really uh, lively discussion. Uh, I will look at you know, three major questions. The first is how Vladimir Putin and the leadership are putting Russia at risk, first and foremost, uh, because of the rising costs of the Ukrainian adventure. My second point is about Russian society and elites Try to convince you, uh, as Yachek has already started to do, that Putin is not highly popular, that the society is very worried, and elites are even more worried because they have much more to lose. And my last point, if I still have a few minutes, uh, will be about the challenges for the EU uh, based on this analysis of the uncertainties for Russia and Russians in the months and years to come. Um, my observations uh, of a country that I've been studying for 30 years, traveling a lot, not only to Moscow, but also to many other regions and parts of Russia, and also knowing quite a bit Ukraine and other post-Soviet countries, is that Vladimir Putin, after more than 15 years, at the helm, is putting his country at risk in order not to put himself at risk uh, and his rule at risk. Um, he is choosing and deliberately choosing conflict in lieu of reform at all. Uh, if you talk to Russian colleagues, friends, and you put it this way, they will all agree. Um, and where then opinions will start to differ is why is it so and how to deal with that situation. But the fact that Putin is the one that went for confrontation with Europe I think you will find very few relatively uh, um, well-informed people in Russia who would disagree with you on that. So I think the whole debate about whether Europe is uh, at fault because we offered Yanukovych an, an Eastern Partnership uh, 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 initializing document uh, uh, in Vilnius, honestly today, it, it's, it's not the important issue. You know, uh, um, and so uh, I think Europe should feel more comfortable with what it's doing, and I think that's what we've heard earlier today. Um, we do have a strategy, clearly, which is that we can no longer forget about the six in-between states. We, it took us years to understand that if we leave those six in-between states sandwiched between Putin, Russia, and us, Europe, the West, NATO, the rest of the world, in a way, 
we are putting at risk those six societies and six economies because they will not get the security, the prosperity they need if we don't offer them some possibility of getting out of the status of in-between, which necessarily is a status of weak sovereignty. So one of you know, the major points I'll, I'll try to make at the end, but uh, I think it's an important point, so if I forget or have no time, is that the mistake we made in a number of European countries, in particular France, was to talk of Ukraine as a bridge between Russia and the West. It was the major contre-sens, you know. That, but then we all of us had a lot of problems fighting against. You know. Ukraine is a big country in the middle of Europe with 45 million people. It cannot be a bridge. Uh, and so I think one of the discussions I'd like us to have today is, you know, is there still sense in the paradigm of a third way for those countries in between? Um, Putin, Putin is putting his country uh, is putting his country at risk. Um, the economic argument, I, I think, doesn't need to be, you know, further discussed. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, Michael or uh, 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 Karen maybe will 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 uh, uh, will say a little more about about this. Um, but what I'd like to say is that both Russians today uh, are hit by the recession and by the isolation. They understand it fully well. Uh, that they are paying, starting to pay the price for conflict and confrontation. They are not stupid at all. And also, as I'm trying to explain, they are not hyper-nationalists. They are very emotional about their country and their personal situation, but uh, uh, it's not the type of classic nationalism that we tend to, uh, to assume uh, uh, they are sort of engulfed, uh, engulfed in. Um, Another point I'd like to make about the economic problems of Russia is that I very much doubt that Asia can be a compensation for what is being lost in trade and relations with the EU and with many other countries of the West, or what I call the extended West, like Turkey, Japan, and others. Remember, sanctions were voted not only by uh, the US, Canada, and the EU, but all the countries linked to us, you know, Norway, Turkey, Japan, New Zealand, Australia. So it's Russia alone with half the rest of the world. And another point that is very important is that Belarus, Kazakhstan, for example, openly criticized uh, the conflict in Donbass. And the, uh, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're very cautious about the annexation of Crimea, and I'm interested and glad that hardly anyone today mentioned Eurasia or Eurasian Union because it is not, you know, a solid project. And you know, Lukashenko did not attend the 9th of May celebrations in Moscow and said he had better to do at home and he could celebrate. He could celebrate at home. So this is really a, a change of balance that I think the previous panel very uh, uh, clearly showed already. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it is amazing how in just a year and a half, um, Russia's adventurous policies have made things happen uh, in our countries. You know, uh, public opinions, in, in government understanding of uh, 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 Russia, Ukraine, uh, uh, and the Eastern uh, uh, Partnership. Um, the diplomatic uh, cost for Russia is, is huge. Um, and the, the, the fact of going for an ideology of the image of the enemy, Obratvraga, of presenting the world around, but even Ukraine as an enemy, is already backfiring. And that's also very interesting in public opinion polls. Uh, a few were mentioned by Jacek. Uh, I have many more that I can mention. 
uh, if, if you wish. And you know, at the end of the day, the leader of the country, who is trying to convince every single Russian that he lives in a besieged fortress, threatened by almost everybody around, might end up in mentalities and perceptions, having people think, could not Putin maybe be the problem? And this is what is starting to happen. And what we see clearly uh, uh, in surveys uh, is that people do not want Ukrainians to be enemies. You know, it was easier to convince them that Georgians could be enemies, but not not Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, 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 this, uh, uh, I think, will start being um, a real problem for the for, for the regime. So now, uh, about society and the elites. It is very difficult to study Russian society today for all the reasons you can imagine. Sociologists are under pressure. Some of them are leaving the country. You know, I don't know if some of you have, uh, 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 are acquainted with uh, uh, Hirschman's uh, uh, paradigm uh, uh, of the early 1970s. Exit, voice, or loyalty. Well, exit, unfortunately, uh, has become, uh, you know, w w one of the uh, uh, solutions uh, or the only solution for uh, 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 many, not only intellectuals, uh, you know, but entrepreneurs, uh, expert journalists, and uh, every week, you know, you have a few more hundreds leaving to uh, other uh, European uh, 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 capitals. Um, so, um, public. Um, it will be easier to talk a little more about the elites because this is uh, elites we can study better with uh, qualified surveys. About public opinion, maybe I will surprise you, but mention uh, a very interesting uh, roundtable at the Leonard Mary conference in Tallinn a few weeks ago, where we had several sociologists and journalists from Russia or who had just emigrated. And one of them was Alexei Levinson, who is an old friend from the Levada Center, and I've been working with the Levada Center uh, from the very inception of the Levada Center uh, in, in the early 1990s. And Alexei was discussing about, you know, the, those supposed 85% of Russians who would be answering that um, uh, 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 they support Putin. And it was clear that he wasn't really convinced. And so then I, I, I asked him, I said, do you think it is fair to use this, this poll? Uh, that, uh, uh, and don't you think what you are presenting are not opinion polls, but emotion polls? And uh, he said, but you're perfectly right. Those are not opinion polls. And you know, the Levada Center itself is under great pressure. And if you look at the way the question is posed and, uh, 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 and the way people answer over the telephone, so it's easy to know who is answering the question, it is clear that even the Levada Center sociologists ask me not to quote their polls. Um, it is not possible to define popularity <coughs> in uh, an authoritarian system where the heart of the system is to forbid any alternative, even thinking about the possibility of an alternative. So if people cannot say, I'd rather have Ivanov or Platov instead of Putin, then the concept of popularity should not even be used. And I am glad that now, uh, um, you know, even uh, opinion pollsters in Russia agree with me on, on, on that. And everything that Yatsek had shown, and I could show you much more, fully uh, 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 um, confirms this. Uh, the great majority of Russians believe the government is not doing its work. The great majority believe it is more corrupt now than 10 years ago. They don't trust anybody or anyone. So why would they trust Putin alone? You know, it doesn't really make sense in, 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 uh, in the Russia of, uh, of today. Um, we have a few other examples of Russian society shifting emotionally 
That was, for example, uh, just after the Kosovo War in the spring of 1999, intense anti-US, anti-NATO propaganda. And you know, we saw opinion changing fast. But then, after a few weeks, going back, not quite to the pre-Kosovo levels, but the, the, the anti-American hysteria really came down quickly. Again, I think those are volatile emotions. Um, they are creating um, um, a new uh, a, a, a new general context that would be much more harmful than 99, 2000, uh, because it's going to last for some time. And so then I believe that it's not benign, that it's going to take time uh, for mentalities in Russia uh, to, you know, come to terms with the fact that, you know, they, they were being misinformed, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Putin cannot be the savior of, um, of, of the nation. Uh, we have one very interesting piece of information uh, that we can you know, uh, uh, check uh, with, with, with other uh, pieces of information, is that uh, nobody in Russia wants to send a young boy to fight, you know, anywhere, you know, in the Caucasus, in Ukraine, or in Georgia. So, um, Russians do not want a war. Uh, and so, if we discuss later how they feel about national identity, about great powerness, etc., please keep in mind that maybe they have those dreams, but they're not prepared to pay for it. <laughs> Certainly not with young uh, 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 conscripts or uh, with paying huge taxes, which they don't uh, uh, today. Um, elites and middle class um, have much more to you to lose than the average um, Russian. Uh, we have a few uh, uh, fascinating surveys, in particular those led by Mikhail Dmitriev um, in, 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 in Russia, uh, that show that the majority of uh, uh, the people that are polled by his group so it is not a representative sample, it is elites in big or middle cities. Um, they are worried. They are worried, they criticize Putin, they criticize the regime. Uh, they don't agree with Donbass usually. It's all there, you know, we have the materials. Uh, and I think they are relatively uh, 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 re reliable. They, uh, they, they make sense. Um, Inside the inner circle, le serail, as we like to call it in French, we have no idea. You know, this is the black box. Uh, but what we know, that we have the information, is that they have a lot to lose, money-wise, and even in terms of their own personal security. And most of them, as you know, have assets, family, children, based uh, outside Russia and mostly in, uh, in, in Western uh, uh, countries. So we may have doubts uh, about their true loyalty to the regime. Uh, um, for the military high command, we have some information. Uh, and it looks like they don't want to go to war either. <laughs> so uh, this is what we get from the relatively reliable experts in Russia who still have some contact. Um, what we know is that the, uh, the high command is not happy with being outcast. You know, for example, just the NATO-Russia council that no longer works, they like that. You know, they like being part of the NATO-Russia uh, NATO uh, council. Um, so what I'm trying to say is um, deductively, of course. I mean, I, you know, I'm giving bits and pieces of information and it is rather impressionist. But what I'm trying to say is it is easier for me as a scholar to show the limits of the system, the vulnerabilities of the cities, than it is for me to try and prove to you that the system is very strong that the entrepreneurs are happy, the military is happy, and uh, middle classes are happy, and fully 
uh, and blindly trust uh, 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 Putin. So, um, if you agree with me that the regime is aging, losing efficacy, is no longer delivering the riches, um, and that as of today, nobody, no institution, uh, 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 can contradict Putin inside Russia without taking huge risks, um, then you know, something has to happen outside Russia, you know, but with Russians, which I think uh, 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 can uh, give us some indication of what the challenges are for the EU, you know, for our countries, and also for the new expanding Russian uh, 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 diasporas. Um, the, I think that the, the major challenges for us, and I will stop there, is um, certainly first to, to, to focus on, on Ukraine, which it seems to me that we all agree that it is, um, uh, it is the key challenge that you know, Ukraine simply cannot fail. Uh, uh, and um, Ukraine probably at some point will be the country that will be able to pull Russia out of the situation where it is. I see it uh, more as, as, as a country that has the potential than to accompany Russia in, uh, in the future. Um, about the Minsk uh, agreement, I'll be happy to discuss it later during, uh, d d d during the discussion. Um, the, the EU uh, certainly has to keep uh, uh, very close contacts with the Kremlin, and in particular with Vladimir Putin, simply because he's the only interlocutor who has authority. So there is absolutely no doubt, but he also has been has to be kept under constant monitoring, and uh, we, which I think I agree with Christian that the Franco-German tandem is doing rather rather nicely. Um, I believe also that a, a major challenge for us is to continue and treat Russian society, Russian voters, as uh, 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 you know as as, as normal potential voters, that is, people that will be asked to vote again, want uh, to express their opinion, and we can help them with that. And uh, don't forget that the Putin regime started to get uh, much tougher after the huge protest against Putin in 2011-2012. That can happen again, and, and it's one of the explanations why Putin could not let Maidan be uh, a nice, peaceful uh, a success, uh, a leading constitutionally to a new, um, a, a, a new government. Um, the, uh, 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 another point that I think we will need to, to discuss, uh, but I will not do uh, uh, it now, is how to confront and fight back I'm not sure it's the right word, but Russian influence inside our countries. I mean, what uh, uh, Petra mentioned uh, earlier, and um, you know, uh, uh, this uh, uh, maybe not so secret uh, uh, instrument, which is to to, to try and, and develop networks, uh, uh, business networks, political networks, uh, funding ex extremist populist um, uh, parties. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, there, there is a policy uh, that is in the making in the EU, and, and I think that's, um, uh, that's uh, rather uh, promising. To conclude, I would say that the, the Russian regime and the Russian economy and Russian society uh, have entered a, a period of trouble, that they know it, that they don't have a clear strategy of how to get through this period of trouble and to get out, out of all the major contradictions, but that um, they are making mistakes. That is, that we tend to read the Ukrainian story in the last two years or so as a succession of successes for Russia. 
um, again, I would be happy <laughs> at another point, you know, to uh, uh, give a different narrative of those two years, also as a succession of mistakes by the Russian authorities that have uh, 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 had a policy with constantly rising costs uh, for themselves and for their own country. So there are always, you know, other ways of of, uh, of reading the story. So certainly, for us, um, I think a leading uh, strategy. And it seems that it is the case, certainly in the EU and and uh, in the US, is to make the cost for Russia greater and greater. I mean, I think this is a sort of a, the bottom line is to convince the Russians that you know their policy in Ukraine will be more and more costly. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. I think it uh, was uh, one of the most uh, optimistic uh, speeches I've ever, ever heard about the topic recently. So. Uh, uh, I actually I give up about the concept that you guys should speak about the economy first. So Mr. Romansov also prepared a presentation. So, uh, I, but I would be pushing with the questions about the sure. economy. Sure. Okay, sure. thanks. We've got the idea. So, Mr. Romansov. Okay, so thank you very very much. Uh, by the way, I, I have to say precisely as Mr. Makhachev has said, I really like your your presentation. It was very interesting even though pretty too much optimistic for me. But, uh, so I will be more pessimistic. Uh, so, economic and political future of Russia from geopolitical perspective. Uh, I would like to, to start with that, that geopolitics is quite problematic discipline within the humanities. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I do not believe that uh, geopolitics or geopolitical theory, that they are able to to answer all questions, etc. I do understand geopolitics as a very useful method through which it's possible to uh, follow uh, the current distribution and historical distribution of force uh, throughout some, some, some period, and, and that's it. Uh, I will start with something what is very well known to everybody who is dealing with Russia, and that's uh, Winston Churchill quotation, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, but perhaps there is a key, that key is a Russian national interest. And I think that maybe this uh, quotation illustrates our problems with Russia, because we are trying to deal with Russia, or previously with Soviet Union, as with society or actor which is similar to us. And as a matter of fact, it is not. Uh, I don't think that the Russians are worse than we are, and we are the better, nothing like that. But simply, they are different. And that's uh, something what I think has to be, has to be highlighted. Uh, another uh, <coughs> typical quotation from Fyodor uh, Dutchev. Умом Россию не понять, аршином общим не измерить, у ней особенное стать, в Россию можно только верить. Uh, who would grasp Russia with the mind, for her no yardstick was created, her soul is of a special kind, by faith alone appreciated. Uh, there are two important phenomena in this uh, quotation. First of all, no yardstick was created. It means that there is something what is, what is essential for Russia, and that is the size of its territory. It is the biggest state in the world since late 16th century, let's say. And that is something what is, to a certain extent, uh, quite visible in activity of all uh, Russian political leaders, be it Tsars, or Stalin, or Putin, or Putin. And then, because of this uh, size of territory, that there is some special kind of, of, of uh, soul. Uh, В Россию можно только верить, you can only trust in, 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 in Russia. Vladimir Putin quite recently said, you have to trust in Russia, which is again something a bit different. Then geopolitics. As I said, geopolitics does not have a single all-encompassing meaning or identity. It is a discourse. And it is a discourse uh, which uh, has some culturally and politically uh, varied ways of describing, representing, and writing about geography and international politics. Again, from Russian point of view, the size of its territory, because it is, and it's evident to everybody, the biggest state which ever existed in history, 
successfully existed for several hundred, uh, several hundred years, uh, it means that uh, Russian uh, basically political position starts and ends always with this first and last argument, we are as big as we are. What's quite important, geography of the world is not an innocent science about Earth because it is not a product of nature. Geography is about power. We are dealing with political borders, with distribution of power and stuff like that. So geography is a product of histories of struggle between competing authorities over the power to organize, occupy and administer space. Most visible product of geography is a map. There was something what we may call a medieval conceptualization and organization of space, which was religious, with maps representing the divine order of the world, so-called vertical organization. This is something what is to a certain extent typical for Russia, because it is the biggest country in the world. And that's it. You don't have to discuss any other things because we are as big as, as we are. That's the vertical organization. Modern organization of space is horizontal one, strongly associated with idea of state sovereignty as emerged from Treaty of Westphalia. And if you will ask current Russian leaders how do they understand uh, sovereignty of state, it's not uh, equality of member of international community, but it's ability to act unilaterally. It's something completely different from what we do believe uh, our, our uh, system of international relations is organized. Most visible geographical phenomenon with political meaning is a state border. Border is a political either bar that fixes for a while an equilibrium between competing political forces or pressures. That's, uh, I think, a great uh, quotation of French uh, political geographer Jacques Ancel. What's quite uh, important, quite recently we uh, witnessed how uh, Russia uh, understands this, this uh, phenomenon because, because uh, Crimea was uh, annexated by Russian Federation, so the border was, was changed, uh, Russia uh, acted uni unilaterally. What's quite important, there is certain, uh, let's say, uh, certain, uh, certain um, uh, moment which is associated with spirituality, with, uh, with uh, uh, let's say, public opinion, etc. And it is that Crimea was declared as a cradle of Russian uh, culture, instead of Kiev or Ukraine. Throughout entire history, Kiev was the mother city of Russian cities. So Ukraine it was holy space. Then all of a sudden it was changed to Crimea. So desacralization of Ukraine and sacralization of, uh, of uh, Crimea. Uh, the full measure of Soviet Russia's otherness uh, uh, did not strike the world until her victory in the Second World War. Prior to the Second World War, the Soviet state was more or less isolated. Why? Because it marked one of the most profound changes of the world equilibrium in modern history. And now, look at this map. This is another change of equilibrium. You can see on the left-hand side map the situation in Europe in 1990, and then in 2009, after so-called Big Bang in 2008. So this is something what quite clearly changed the existing equilibrium. And now look at this. The left-hand side map, it's how Europeans are perceiving the situation, and the right-hand side map, uh, how it is, uh, let's say, how, how, how it was evaluated and how, how it was used quite successfully, I would say, as a PR tool uh, by Russian, by Russian uh, elites. Uh, now, German school of geopolitics. Why German school of geopolitics? Uh, once upon a time, there was quite young, very uh, prosperous uh, nation in Europe, uh, which uh, was uh, able to accommodate uh, itself uh, to industrial revolution, and that was uh, Germany. Very modern, very successful, but political elites of Germany were disparate because uh, they were dis dissatisfied with uh, the position of Germany within the uh, international uh, 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 relations uh, of, of, of that time. They were the colonies, Germany was small, and it was largely believed that if you are successful, you have to be big. So they tried twice, the First and the Second World War, they tried somehow to change it. Uh, now, 
there is a country, and that's the Rus Russian Federation, which is big, but the Russia is unable to modernize herself again and again and again. Basically, the modern history of, of Russia, its continual history of failed attempt how to modernize Russia. So they are big, but they are not successful. And even though that average Russians are quite satisfied with their uh, situation, because for the first time in modern history, they are not hungry, and that is something what is important, Russian political elites are as dissatisfied, or desperate maybe, with position of Russian Federation in current uh, system of international relations as German elites were in uh, early 1910s, uh, uh, so prior to the First and the Second World War. Uh, Karl Haushofer uh, came with, um, uh, with the last and perhaps the most influential author of German School of Geopolitics. He came with um, uh, quite strange uh, model of the world, which uh, was uh, the entire world was divided into four pan regions. Uh, every single one of them, huge territory with huge natural resources, with big population, and because of that, the entire world would be stabilized. Four leading countries or four leading centers, the United States, Germany in Europe, Russia in that part of the world, and Japan. And there was the uh, huge market, huge uh, deposits of, of natural resources, etc., etc. This model was produced as a, uh, something what was, uh, what was uh, going against uh, the, the, the model of, of the world which was uh, produced by the uh, British Empire, and that was the globalized world. Globalized, globalized world which was interconnected because of maritime, uh, maritime traffic. Germany instead came with this basically stable model where you don't have to communicate if you don't want to. Because four leading powers are equipped with everything what they need. Now, look at this picture. Uh, that's uh, Russian leader Vladimir Putin and uh, home elf Dobby from uh, the Harry Potter series. And lawyers in Russia threatened to sue Warner Brothers because Dobby, the house elf, closely resembled Russian President Vladimir Putin. Why I am uh, dealing with Harry Potter? Let me, let me quote for a while. Don't worry, it will be quite, uh, quite, uh, quite short. I know Goblet, said Bill. I worked for Gringotts ever since I left Hogwarts. As far as there can be friendship between wizards and Goblin, I have Goblin friends. Or at least Goblin I know, I, I know well and like. Harry, what do you want from Gribrook, and what have you promised in return? I can't tell you, said Harry. Sorry. Then I have to say this, Bill. Bill went on. If you have stuck any kind of bargain with Gribrook, and most particularly if that bargain involves treasure, you must be exceptionally careful. Goblin notions of ownership, payment, and repayment are not the same as human ones. What do you mean, Harry asked. We are talking about a different breed of being, so, said Bill. Dealing between wizards and goblins have been fraught for centuries. There has been fought on both sides. I would never claim that wizards have been innocent. However, there is a belief among some goblins that wizards cannot be trusted in matter of gold and treasure. I respect uh, their ownership, said Harry. You don't understand, Harry. Nobody could understand unless they have lived with goblins. To a goblin, the rightful and true master of any object is the maker, not the purchaser. All goblin-made objects are, in goblin eyes, rightfully theirs. But it was bought, Harry objected. Then they would consider it rented by the one who had paid the money. They have, however, great difficulty with the idea of goblin-made object passing, passing from wizard to wizard. Now, uh, sorry. Yeah, look at, look at this picture. And this picture, uh, from this picture you can see uh, Ivan the Force or Ivan the Terrible dealing with English merchants. You can perfectly see who is European and who is not. Since Peter the Great shaped himself, you are unable to find the difference. So Russians, they are part of European culture from this point of view. But if you are dealing with Russians from political or economic point of view, their mentality is different. Again, I don't want to say or to, to, to conclude that our approach is better than theirs. Only it is different. 
Look at this, uh, this uh, graph, and you can see how big, relative, how, 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 how approximately big are leading, uh, leading um, economies uh, of the world. There is a country which is dominating because of her size, and this country is practically invisible within uh, the world where economic uh, potential is the most uh, important phenomenon. We have uh, something what is called as G20 major economies, and Russia is not dominating them. And Russian elites are frustrated. Look at this. Uh, this is a uh, Putin project of, uh, of uh, Eurasian uh, Union, uh, which uh, is uh, composed out of European Union and Euro Eurasian Economic Union under uh, Russian Federation. It was his uh, beloved child. Uh, what's quite interesting, since annexation of Crimea, basically is not speaking about this model any, anymore. Uh, why, is, uh, why is that? Uh, Look at, look at this map and you can see European Union together with some post-Soviet space under Russian, uh, under Russian leadership. This model, to me, maybe you will, maybe you won't agree, you will see, resembles something what was, uh, what was declared by Gorbachev in 1987 and it is Europe as a uh, common house. Europe for Europeans, Europe from Atlantic periphery to the Euro mountains. And uh, there was one uh, quite interesting phenomenon inside of this concept. And that was that if ever there will be this European house from Atlantic periphery to Euro mountains, then in this house there is no space for the United States. In 1989, President Bush came with uh, his own project, and that was Europe whole and free. Whole Europe is perfectly acceptable for Russia. Free Europe is entirely unacceptable for them. But then, 1989, Berlin Wall fall, and, 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 and the entire situation was different. Look at uh, this. Uh, this uh, look at look at the same project uh, in 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 this perspective. You cannot uh, see the difference between European uh, Union and Russia. It's all in one color, stretching from Lisbon to Vladivostok. And if this uh, part of Eurasia is interconnected, who is out? Not only United States, but also China. China is not part of this. China doesn't fit into this scheme. Since the annexation of Crimea, nevertheless, it was changed, and Russia who previously was dreaming about possibility to be uh, located between European Union and China and to supply both markets with its uh, natural products, suddenly changed its rhetoric and instead of uh, cooperate with Europe, uh, they declared they want to cooperate with China. But look at this uh, region, that's uh, the region around North Pole, and here you can see that Russia is desperately trying to find a partner for carving up the Arctic. This is something what is natural for Russia. It's not cooperation. Russia wants to divide things and to create as big a uh, uh, portion of Earth uh, as it's possible just for herself. So she is able to sell the products which are there to different customers. And what's quite uh, important, what do they want? They are dissatisfied if for their natural products they are receiving money. Money is not enough for them. They want something more. They want respect and they want loyalty. If you are using our gas, if you are burning our oil, you have to be grateful that we are willing to share it with you. Why? Because all those natural resources are carved out or pumped out from the holy body of Mother Russia. Look at, look, at this, uh, look at this map, and you can see so-called Eurasian land bridges. China has several projects how to interconnect Chinese territory with Europe. <coughs> Europe is, uh, at the moment and for many, many years to come, uh, the biggest market for all uh, Chinese products, and China is trying, trying to diversify uh, its, its uh, transport corridors. What's quite important, currently, 
like one percent of entire Chinese uh, exports to Europe are uh, carried through this land bridge. If all those uh, three possibilities, which are Mark there will ever uh, became, became reality, then it will be increased from one up to five, maybe six percent. It means that something between 99 and 95 percent of uh, all uh, Chinese European trade still will be organized in maritime uh, traffic. Why it is important? Because China, as well. Uh, this, is, this is the same, same um, uh, territory, uh, just from different perspective, because you can see so-called Silk Road economic belt and maritime Silk, Silk Road, because China is heavily, heavily uh, engaged in, in maritime traffic. China is a part of the same world, even though the culture is absolutely different, as we are. China is also dependent on maritime traffic. China is dependent on uh, exchange of goods of uh, materials, of interest and ideas, while Russia is not. Look at this map. From this map you can see how heavily, uh, how, how heavy is the traffic within the world ocean, especially between Asia Pacific and uh, the United States and across the, uh, the uh, Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean. There is only one country which is practically invisible from this perspective, and that is Russia. Look and see what is uh, the Russian response uh, to what <coughs> happened in Europe. Once it was uh, evident that we are not paying respect and loyalty because they are providing us with, uh, with gas and oil, here you can see this mental concept which is introduced to a certain degree uh, successfully among Russian, Russian uh, elites. So, conclusions. Russian uh, Federation, there is a vertical organization of political space instead of horizontal one. Extension of Russia's territory generates automatically its supreme position in the world. So far, victorious Russia has, was always safe or was able to escape from any problems uh, or reforms because the size of its territory. Mentality of landlocked state focused on autarky uh, ability to act uh, self-sufficiently and thus hostile to interconnected world dependent on maritime trade. Russia is a uh, uh, champion of autarky while the world is leading towards dependency. Uh, Russia uh, does, uh, has no confidence in, uh, in uh, her neighbors uh, while the rest of the world is trying to build some confidence. World is uh, open Russia is closed, and her political elites are desperately trying to restore previously existing balance of power. And the only way how to obtain it is to produce great ring of instability alongside Russian borders, from Ukraine across the Middle East through Central Asia to uh, to uh, Manchuria and to the uh, Russian Chinese border. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, it wasn't that optimistic, but it was certainly very entertaining <laughs> and funny. Uh, and uh, but still, we didn't hear much that much about the economy. So Mr. Svoboda is the only one who I would push to speak about the economy, but he's ready to speak about the economy. So uh, the floor is yours. So I've got five minutes left, so that's... Oh, that's you can speak a little bit longer. Uh, maybe seven, okay. Uh, so, well, at first I, will, I, will, I would like to quote Niels Bohr and uh, to answer the question about prediction. Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about future. So, uh, any economists, and well, if you are asked about the, the oil prices, well, the frank, frankly said, the only precise prediction I may give you is it will grow, it will fall, or, or it will stagnate. So that, uh, that's my point. Uh, well, let's say I'll start with uh, Vladimir Putin and his, his simply lucky child. Or he was lucky child. When he uh, came to Paris, Russia was at its lows. And for eight years, Russia only grew. The, the oil prices grew. And well, at least this is my speculation. But for him, it seemed I am perfect because I can drive the economy. Because, well, it grows. And everything I do is perfect. 
I introduced the reforms at first, then, okay, well, real national, um, nationalization, and, well, 2008, he left the post of president, and Russia fell. So, another confirmation, he was perfect. And then in 2012, he came back and expected this will turn back. Russia will grow. Russia would grow. But it did not. And whom to blame? Of course, some foreign forces whatsoever. I do not say that this is the only motif behind uh, Vladimir Putin's behavior. But, well, it may add to his siege uh, ideology and uh, this. Uh, so let's say, let's say I should speak more about, uh, about the economy itself. Uh, well, the stagnation of Russia's economy after the fall in 2009, Russia fell by some 7.8% of its GDP. Russia began to stagnate already in 2012. The first signs of, of stagnation were visible in 2012, and that was the period of extremely high prices for oil. So, uh, what we have to bear in mind is that the problems are not only, only uh, from external uh, environment, but also from inside. I would like to concentrate more on the on the internal problems, but well, I have to speak a bit about about external uh, external as well. What we should not exaggerate was the fall in 2009, because well, Russia uh, part of the GDP is net exports, and well, of course, once they fell and the prices for oil fell, well, the net exports fell as well. However, Russia already accumulated enough sources in a, a so-called um, national welfare fund and uh, the reserve, uh, reserve fund, sorry, uh, together taken uh, today some 75, uh, sorry, uh, 150 billion US dollars. Uh, it's considerably less than it used to have in, uh, let's say, at the start of the year 2014. But still, it's kind of good pillow for, for, for Russia's economy. However, it may be insufficient. Uh, why? Uh, let's say the, the reserve fund is dedicated to one, one uh, aim, and it's coverage of uh, the deficit of state budget. Currently, Russia runs uh, state budget deficit around 4%. The whole reserve fund is set at 10% of GDP. This is one part of the story. So, so the estimates are that, well, already sometimes in 2016, 15, uh, not 15, 16, uh, the national, uh, sorry, the reserve fund may be already gone. Uh, with the national welfare fund, it's a bit more complicated be, uh, because, well, it is to be to be invested in in uh, securities of reliable countries and uh, to highest highest ranking securities. So so. Uh, these 75 billion US dollars, uh, they are still kind of, kind of there. However, uh, there is a problem for Russian, Russian companies, and the, the problem came with the sanctions. Frankly said, when I'm asked about, about, the, about the sanctions themselves, do they really, really have any effect on Russia? Or I, are they really effective? I say, well, mostly no. Do we have to maintain them? Yes, absolutely. Well, san sanctions are sort of expression, we have to do something, we did something. And well, waging a war against Russia, well, that would hardly get any support. 
especially with the, with the rockets and, and uh, nuclear bombs and so on. So, so this is no option. For Russia, uh, well, we have to divide the sanctions into three parts. The first part were uh, the sanctions which were targeted on separate persons. These were really painful for, for uh, the Putins in, uh, in trade. And they hit directly the people. The other part were the san sectoral sanctions, and they hit Russia's economy. Probably not in, let's say, let's say direct, uh, direct hit, because the sanctions, the limits for, for uh, foreign financing, uh, inability to finance uh, from foreign sources, it comes from future projects. So it hampers all the investment projects mm -hmm. of Rosneft, Gazprom, and companies like this. And they have to find the sources inside the country. And the last one, these were counter sanctions. Oh, watch out, the camera. Um, it is my speculation, and, and I love to speculate, I'm, I'm sorry, but it is my speculation that it was even intentionally, that these sanctions were even intentionally adopted by Mr. Putin to increase the pain for the Russian population. Because then, with the whole atmosphere and propaganda stating, look, we are endangered by the West. The West wants to destroy us. The burden will be shared not just by the elites, but also by the population. Although it did not work uh, really well, as we as we could see from the uh, from the public opinion polls, and this is my speculation. We can just speculate. I'm, I'm sorry for this. Uh, so. These are, let's say, like external pressures. However, Russia's economy, it's got huge problems in the internal uh, structure as well. And the very structure is the problem. Well, try to have a look, uh, uh, try to have a look around you and find at least something Russian. Well, the problem is that well, Russian, Russian products are highly uncompetitive. Even after the fall of ruble, and you remember it was, I think, 14th of December when the ruble fell by, by some, some, uh, some 20 rubles for a dollar. I remember I had, I had my lecture to my, to my students and I showed them well, the graph of, of relation of, of Russian ruble to, to dollar and it was some 80 and, and no, it was for euro. It was some 80 and at the end of the lecture it was 100. So, so it was really steep dive. Of course, ruble then stabilized somehow. However, the problem is still there. The case is that all these sanctions, all the rumors, and I would say that sanctions themselves are not that painful as the rumors about the sanctions and what comes behind them. Because you may deal with lack of foreign financing, you may, you may try to find China or, or whatsoever, but the problem is this kind of feeling of insecurity. What is coming next? What will be the next problem? What we might expect? what kind of impact it will have. Uh, so, let's say about the structure uh, of Russia's economy, about 70% of its exports are simply oil and gas. <coughs> even the subsequent production, it gives even more. So the whole country is still dependent on these two commodities. Russia itself, it tried to somehow fight this problem. However, all the Skokol projects and, and others, well, uh, I have strongly doubt that there is something behind Skokol right, right now. Uh, what is the other problem for, for Russia's economy is low level of investment. 
Russians simply do not invest into the economy right now. And I do not speak only about the FDIs, uh, foreign direct investment, sorry. Foreign direct investment, uh, average foreign direct investment yearly uh, was about 13 billion US dollars, which is extremely low. Okay, okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, well, I'll just, uh, I can just tell you that, well, I wrote the whole paper from my notes, so I'll give it to Petra and, and well, probably you may download that. Uh, so, uh, let's say this is, this is another problem, investment. Russia is not attractive for foreign investors. Since the Magnitsky case, where, when simply the whole Hermitage capital was stolen. It was stolen, and with with full acceptance of Russian courts, it was stolen. And Sergei Magnitsky, he was not directly killed. He was just left to die. Well, the belief in in a business environment is extremely low. Russia suffers each year. And the year 2014 was record one. Suffers outflow of capital about some, well, 2014 it was 150 billion, billion US dollars. And well, of course, even there is outflow of FDIs. Simply, the factories are not being built, they're even closed down. Instead of that, what comes? speculative capital, which runs away once there is a problem, as happened in uh, 1998. So this is, this is another problem. Another problem are regional budgets. In 2012, Vladimir Putin, uh, in his pre-election campaign, he announced so-called Maiskia Ukazy. What he promised, he promised everything to everybody. Quite simply said. However, he promised that the regions were to be the ones who pays. And that's the problem. Well, he said, well, they will increase your pensions, they will increase your, your uh, salaries. But they did not give them the money. So currently, well, as you could read, one of the, of the regions already went bankrupt officially, and according to Natalia Zubarevich, excellent Russian economist who was here several months uh, month ago, around 20 of Russia's regions are already bankrupt. The whole debt is around 2 trillion uh, Russian rubles, which means 40, 40 billion, billion uh, US dollars. Okay, well, so I'll conclude. Uh, the problem, problem is uh, foreign indebtedness of Russian companies. Russian banking system is too small to finance uh, Russian companies. Debt of uh, Russian, Russian regions, military spending, budget deficit, and this all on the expenditure side. And on the income side, there is problem that, well, a Russian budget counted with the price $106 for a barrel. Now it's some 70. So the gap is increasing. And as I, as I said, in 2016, Russia may simply run out of money. Of course, this is some uh, really pessimistic scenario. What I expect more will be long-term stagnation. This is what I expect for Russia. So sorry for closing it somewhere in the middle, but you will read it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I got a note here that actually we have to conclude at this moment, so there will be no open uh, discussion since uh, a lot of the guests and panelists have to run for the airport, but for those who have still have time, you can discuss individually in the corridor with the speakers. But the official part is over, 
so thank you all for coming and thanks for invitation and see you next time. Let me, let me just briefly add to conclude the conference so very quickly and unexpectedly uh, again to remind you that you will all have the possibility to read the follow-up materials including some of the background materials for the presentations and of course the speakers will be happy to respond. I would like to again uh, like to thank our partners uh, Sethes and Serisian for uh, it was truly a pleasure to have you here including uh, Marie here on the panel and of course I'm very much looking forward to our future cooperation and I'll ask for the very few concluding remarks Jacques Lupin. Well I will reassure everybody I will not try to sum up uh, do some conclusion for a general meeting uh, no I, I, like everybody I'm probably a bit frustrated uh, not to be able to discuss the, the presentations on uh, on Russia uh, I'm interested that the that both scenarios are bad. I mean, the, the, for, for 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 Putin, but the the bad political scenario was called optimistic. <laughs> the bad economic scenario was called pessimistic. Okay, well, <laughs> take it <laughs> the way you uh, the way you wish. I think that what we uh, clearly have is that just as during the Cold War, you know, specialists historians were distinguishing long cycles and short cycles. You had a long cycle of Cold War with interspersed with brief periods of détente or long cycle of détente with few periods of tensions. I think we're in for a long cycle now with Russia, with whatever you want to call it, new Cold War or tension or whatever. Uh, and therefore, that will give us opportunity to return to the subject. In our annual meetings, we have exhausted quite a few themes Transatlantic, the crisis, uh, uh, this time Russia in the neighborhood. Uh, we will think of a new crisis for next year, I'm sure. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank you.